this time on The Procedure. The aortic valve is the final doorway in the heart that allows blood to be pushed out of the heart to the aorta and in turn out to the rest of the body. When this valve becomes narrowed, usually due to aging and calcification, it is called aortic stenosis. These damaged heart valves no longer allow the heart to pump blood out efficiently, causing patients to feel chest pain, dizziness, shortness of breath, and fatigue. Historically, severe aortic stenosis has been treated through open heart surgery, where the old valve is cut out and a new aortic valve is sewn in. While this surgery is very successful, some patients are too sick, too old, or too fragile to undergo such an invasive surgery. Recently, a new treatment has emerged, where doctors can replace the aortic valve from within using catheter-based non-surgical techniques by directing a new valve up through the aorta and deploying it right over the old damaged valve. Today, we will take you into the endovascular lab to see one of these procedures firsthand, a procedure that is revolutionizing heart valve treatment and returning patients to the life they once lived. The procedure is made possible by educational grants from Medtronic and Siemens Health and Ears. And welcome to the procedure. I am Brad Perry, your host, and I'm standing here with Dr. Reisig, who is uh, very, pretty much educating me and you out there on this amazing surgery that we're going to be seeing today. Good morning, doctor. How are good you? Good morning. It's so good to have you, and we're delighted to have Dr. Robert Riley, our director of cardiovascular surgery. So we have an interventional cardiologist and a cardiovascular surgeon working together on these procedures today. This is a live heart procedure. It is a aortic valve replacement. And let's talk a little about that because last time we were here, we did a stent and then before that we did a repair. We did a valve repair. So what is the difference that's going on here? This is a valve replacement. As you remember the repair we did, we used non-surgical catheter-based technique. We, uh, uh, and we were able to repair the valve. This time we're going to actually place a new valve in the body, in the old aortic valve, and in doing so, we're just going to kind of wallpaper over that old valve and we'll give this patient a brand new functioning valve compared to the degenerated valve that he has right now. Wow, and I know we're preparing for this. It's, it's going to be amazing. We have some stories to talk about and to explain to you, but then we will be going through the surgery, which again is just amazing. And uh, first time, well not first time, but before, you really wouldn't have the two doctors in here like this, would you? Right, right, right. But, you know, a lot of the catheter-based procedures are uh, like TAVR, what we're going to show today, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. A lot of those uh, procedures just have an interventional cardiologist. We have a surgeon, and this is a, a new heart team approach where the interventional cardiologist and the surgeon work together on a non-surgical procedure. Now, Bob, this is a catheter-based non-surgical valve replacement. Are we still doing open heart surgery on valves? We still are. We're still doing open heart surgery, but it's not necessarily the traditional open heart surgery that you might have thought of where we go through the center of the chest. We still do that for some operations, but for the, the aortic valve surgery, we're doing more and more minimally invasive or but, keyhole or... Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to make that point. You, you've been a, a pioneer and an innovator in minimally invasive surgical valve replacement, and so we really have choices for our patient, don't we? I think we have a, a broad spectrum of choices from a traditional full incision to a small incision to a catheter base. So the whole gamut is available to the patients here. And that's the beauty of the heart team working together. We work together and we make a decision together as a team what would best fit this patient. Yeah, so we want you to sit back, pay attention because this is life-saving and you might have someone in your family uh, that might need to have the surgery. So once you learn what's happening, you can talk with them, help them, educate them, and that's what these surgeries are about. You know, the, the leading up to this procedure, I thought the most fun part of this 
was talking about the pioneers in catheter-based procedures. We had a chance to talk to them last week. Two really, really uh, committed pioneers in the early days. Yeah, it was amazing. So please meet the pioneers. So here we are in Scottsdale, Arizona, and only a few miles from here, there was a meeting at the Phoenician. Dr. Dietrich, a mentor for many of us here in Arizona, was conducting an international meeting, and a doctor from Europe, a Dr. Henning Rudd Anderson, came to that meeting. And it was only a few miles from here, as he was sitting in the audience uh, at this meeting, the light bulb went off, and he came up with the idea of replacing heart valves non-surgically by going up through the leg. Uh, he actually came up with this, this concept of TAVR. Dr. Anderson, how are you? It's very nice to, uh, to be with you today. Thank you. You know, we have an audience of uh, non-medical people who uh, want to hear your story about how you came up with the idea for replacing valves non-surgically uh, with this, this uh, technology called TAVR. I was attending a meeting there back in, in 89, one of the meetings arranged by Professor Dietrich from the Arizona Heart Institute. And uh, I was listening to some of the pioneers from that time in 89. And then while I was listening to one of the great guys, his name is Julio Palmas. He invented the balloon uh, expandable stents which you can put into the coronary arteries. So when I was listening to him at that meeting, I suddenly got the idea that, uh, oh, Henning, why don't you make this stent much, much bigger and then put a valve inside? Then it should be possible for me to implant artificial heart valves. So I simply went back home, built something like that, and did the first in animal two and a half months later. When you were at the meeting in Scottsdale, uh, uh, did you take notes, or I, I understood that you originally wrote your your uh, original ideas on a napkin? Maybe on a napkin. I really can't remember anymore. I know I have so many documents in my library from the old days. And maybe something is hiding out there. I don't know. There's a story also that you carry dear to your heart um, because this is amazing. And I, I think Dr. Reisa, you were telling me it's it's napkin to. From, from, the, from the napkin to my father, you, you came up with a technology that ended up being life-saving for your father. Uh, at that time, my dad was 86, and he had a severe aortic stenosis, a calcified heart valve. And uh, I found out about it, and I uh, said to him, oh, daddy, you have, to, you have to get some kind of treatment. And of course, there were two kinds of treatments for, for, for this disease. It was either standard open chest surgery, where the surgeons put in a new valve. Alternatively, it was my invention should be treated with. I think it's the best gift I have ever given my dad. He lived for eight years. He died one and a half year ago in the age of 95. Not from cardiac symptoms, but he was an old man. When you first thought of this uh, concept, did you ever imagine that this would explode the way that it has and really supplant surgical treatment for aortic valve disease? When I came up with the idea 32 years ago, uh, nobody believed in it. People said that, I remember my own professor, he said, Henning, it's impossible, you cannot do that. But go on, try, but you cannot do that, it's impossible. And, you know, there were so many people at that time uh, which didn't believe in it. Some of them actually got angry because there was a medical doctor coming and saying you can put heart valves in without doing surgery. But it is the normal way uh, if, if somebody comes up with, a, let's say, a disruptive invention which is going to change the world, it takes a lot of years. It's not a and it's, it's, it's the same, it's the same, you know, this is medical science. But also, if you are an author, come up with a new way of writing books, or if you're a painter and, and I start to paint in other ways, you mean, you know, it's quite the same process. There's a lot of resistance from the community and it takes you a lot of uh, years to come through. 
Dr. Anderson, uh, we can't thank you enough for uh, for being a part of this. Uh, it's just such an honor uh, to to hear uh, your experience and the stories and the origins of Taver, and for the many patients whose lives you've affected. We 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 we're so grateful. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, and give my regards to your audience down there. Brad, uh, now what I would like to do is introduce you uh, to my mentor and actually uh, the innovator who performed the first transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR in the United States, Dr. William O'Neill. Dr. O'Neill, if you don't mind, give us a little bit of your perspective on how this all started. What were the, the growing pains in this, in this space? Well, we did the first TAVR in North America in February 2005. A gentleman that was a car dealer that was, uh, I met him on Christmas. He was in, in, in his uh, CCU bed uh, crying uh, uncontrollably because he was told that he had no hope, that he had a bad heart, and that he had a bad valve. And on Christmas Eve, I did a complex angioplasty to fix his coronary arteries. He got better from that. We also did a valvuloplasty, stretched the valve to try to give him some relief. And he did fantastic for about a month, but then the valve started to re-narrow. And we'd had this protocol available that had just gotten approved mid-January. So early in February 2005, we brought him to Beaumont. We brought him to the cath lab. And uh, we were able to uh, go through his, his vessels uh, into his heart and then deploy the valve. And uh, the valve procedure went great. The patient did fantastically. He lived for six and a half years. And I still have a picture of him uh, sitting in his hot uh, Mustang convertible. He told me that he got it up to 100 miles an hour to celebrate his one year after his TAVR. So uh, for me, uh, this was the first successful TAVR, the first successful one that was done in North America. And it really, really led me to be a real believer that this could be absolutely life-saving uh, breakthrough technology for very ill patients. What is the future in terms of what we're going to see in terms of the numbers of, of these types of TAVR procedures? Uh, we're, we're, we're on the dawn of a new day where very little uh, uh, valvular intervention is going to be done surgically. I think the vast majority of the interventions, aortic, mitral, tricuspid, are going to be done with transcatheter techniques. Open heart surgery for a re replacement is almost, uh, in our institution, is really rare now. So we're, we're doing this, and, and, but the procedure just gotten infinitely better, uh, safer, more usable. Uh, it, there, it's a very similar analogy to angioplasty and to then stents and then to drug eluting stents. I mean, the thing that's wonderful is that the combination between uh, physicians and industry is indispensable for medical progress. Without us in the cath lab, knowing what the problems were and working with industry to fix the problems, none of that would have ever happened. And the brilliance of, of industry is that they can come up with better, smaller, safer, more deliverable products. So it's just uh, a dream now. I mean, we, we did six tavers today and we were done by three o'clock. Wow. So, um, you, you'd never be able to do six open hearts uh, on a Thursday and be done by three o'clock. Yeah. yeah. It's always great to talk to you, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your experience with us. Take care. Thank you, doctor. My name is Sally. I am a full-time artist. This is my working studio, as well as uh, the home gallery that people come to sometimes. My husband died seven years ago, and so that gave me a lot of time to consider what I was going to be doing with my life and looking at the current reality to see what I would like to be doing, and of course it was art because that's always been what I have enjoyed. Both of these paintings are done with alcohol ink. Um, this one is done on a tile. In February of 1972, I became Fountain Hill's very first resident. I was very healthy. My husband and I were country western dancers and danced with a group and danced in parades. And I was shocked to be um, diagnosed in 1999 with um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That started a saga that lasted until um, 2006. I know that the papers, all the papers that I signed for chemo, all 
warn you that um, there could be deterioration in, heart, in the heart functioning. Um, and I dismissed it pretty much because I just really wanted to survive and figured if that's the case that you don't want to deal with it. I didn't realize um, because I had had lymphoma and a lot of years when it wasn't as strong, I was accustomed to resting when I needed to. I thought maybe it was aging. <laughs> so I, I was very surprised to discover there was actually a, you know, a deterioration that needed correction. And it took me to Dr. Rysik. Two years ago, I needed to have a, the aorta valve replaced and was able to have that done with the TAVR procedure. What's unique uh, about Sally is, is not just her case from a medical standpoint, but it's who she is as a person. She is a fixture in uh, the art scene in, in Scottsdale. She had aortic stenosis, but it was a unique case. She had also received radiation therapy to the chest, which can set up an inflammatory process in the chest and with the aortic valve, and we believe that was a significant contribution to her development of aortic stenosis. Because of the radiation the therapy to the chest, it becomes sort of a hostile environment for performing open heart surgery. It makes open heart surgery even higher risk. And therefore, uh, transcatheter uh, valve therapy made sense to us. Aortic stenosis is when the aortic valve starts to narrow. Now the aortic valve is the valve which allows blood to flow out of the heart from the main pumping chamber of the heart blood ventricle. That valve can wear down over time and become calcified and thicken. That prevents it from opening normally and puts a lot of strain on the system and minimizes the amount of blood flow that can leave and get to the rest of the body. After evaluating Sally, we determined that she was an excellent candidate for a transcatheter aortic valve replacement, where we were able to insert a valve through the leg and pass it up through the arteries to her heart and deploy or release this valve inside of the old valve that wasn't working. This valve holds the old valve open, out of the way, so the new valve inside of this works normally. Uh, we were able to adequately implant the TAVR valve and there was almost immediate improvement in her symptoms. I didn't realize until the procedure was done and I felt healed that I was so much more energetic and that, that I started taking on all kinds of commitments <laughs> because that's, I'm happiest when I'm busy. It's, it's funny, uh, Sally's world and our world she talks a lot about creativity, and so much of what we do is based on science. Uh, but like Sally, so much of medicine and TAVR and all of the uh, highly technical things we offer are really uh, also artistic. There's a lot of art to what we do, not just science. I think that art is partly an attitude. I've had so many hard, life change experiences in losing my sister to cancer and then two years later my daughter to cancer and then two years later my husband to cancer. I could be defeated by that or I could be creative by that and make some reasons to still have a lot of joy. I would always feel extremely grateful to the doctors that have made my life what it is today. No matter what it is that people pour their heart and time into, um, I especially appreciate it when it's something that benefits other people, gives joy to other people, or in the case of medical procedures, gives life, gives life itself. Wow, Dr. Isaac. Isn't that uh, a great story? Great story. Meeting those two um, was amazing too. And, right. and, and this is such an amazing, and we could say groundbreaking Absolutely. procedure. Absolutely. You know, the highlight for me was meeting the pioneers, meeting some of these patients to relive their stories. But I also very much enjoyed the fact that leading up to this, you actually had the opportunity to perform 
a, a TAVR procedure on a simulator device that our friends from Medtronic brought in. Yeah, and it was just so amazing to see what you guys are going to do here through this simulator. Take a look. So, Brad, when Dr. Burke and I talk about doing these procedures, when we're first learning them, uh, learning how to do these procedures, we say see one, do one, and then teach one. That's the cadence where you're going to get a chance to do one using this model. This is a model from Medtronics, um, and the device we're actually going to put in is this valve, okay? And this valve is going to go into, uh, partially into the aorta, partially into the, the main pumping chamber of the heart, the left ventricle, and once it does, um, it'll open and close with each uh, pumping motion or cardiac cycle. Wow, okay? that is so amazing that, that, that this is going into someone. This, this size here. That's right, wow. but it is crimped. It is crimped on this catheter. So this is the delivery catheter, very similar to what you're seeing here. This is the delivery catheter, and what you'll do once we get the valve into place, we will turn this knob this way, and the valve will eventually open up into uh, in this model, the, the heart and the partially into the aorta. All the time that we're deploying this, Dr. Burke is giving us real-time feedback with cardiac ultrasound or echocardiography. So, Dr. Burke, what's something that we should be looking at when we are watching this being put in? So what you're going to see is that it's going to open up from the bottom to the top. Okay, so the bottom opens up and it flares. So what happens specifically is this will be closed. This will be all crimped down, and then it's going to come out, and it's going to spring out in this direction as you guys open it up until eventually you decide to release. So this actually pushes against the native valve, the aortic valve that's been diseased, and secures it and allows it not to leak around the valve. So you go from a valve that opens up, you can't even see the opening, to something that's going to open up, and you have that nice wide open view of the valve. And with every heartbeat, it opens, and then it closes down again. And that's what we're going to be doing. Wow, this is amazing. OK, I know we can't do it alone. You also have someone standing next to you, Livet, who is here to help us, who's there in the operating room, too, with us, right? We have Brenda Arnold. She's an expert from Medtronic, the company that makes this valve. She's our eyes and our ears in the uh, cardiac catheterization laboratory when we're implanting these valves. And she's really an expert on how to, how to prep this device and how to work this device. Wow, OK, I know we have one set up already before we start. But here is one that isn't. This is what we are going to be using, right? That's exactly right. And so as it's being advanced, this lever here or this knob here has the arrows and it tells you which way to turn this. So as Dr. Burke said, it opens from a bottom to top uh, configuration once it's in the old or diseased aortic valve. All right, I'm ready now. All right, let's, All right, do, this. let's do this. All right, so what are we going to do? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to advance the valve. You can see the valve being advanced here, all right? And now it's coming over what we call the arch of the aorta. Brenda, will you give us a little wire tension on the back end? Okay, so, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing? Yeah. No, that's Brenda's okay. job. Okay. This is being advanced around the aorta. Dr. Burke, would you show everyone where the aorta is? So the aorta is going to be right down here. There's a black dot that you can see, and there are two tubes that are sticking out which represent the coronary arteries, which supply blood to the heart muscle itself. So now the valve is coming down, and I think we're going to stop about right there. What do you think, Dr. Burke? Is that pretty good? That's looking good. So we're looking at right at the annular level, and that's where this valve is going to secure itself to hold itself in place safely. What do you think, Dr. Perry? Um, Dr. Burke, it looks okay? <laughs> you look great. That's what I do right there. Okay. He concurs. <laughs> I concur. So I do have a question for you, because right now we're here in a, stim in a simulator looking down at this, but right. you guys are actually having to look on a monitor doing this, right? Dr. Burke? Yes, so exactly what we do is that we'll use echocardiography, ultrasound, and also x-ray, fluoroscopy, to look at this in real time while the heart is still beating, and be able to see where the valve is, how deep it is, and determine whether or not we're in the right place to allow that valve to open up 
and then to be released. We okay. call this multi-modality imaging. We have right in front of us several TV screens. One is an x-ray machine. One is uh, the images that Dr. Burke is giving us from ultrasound. And so using multiple imaging techniques, we can perfect the implant and having those multiple uh, imaging techniques makes it really fast and slick. Wow, okay, where are okay, we at now? now? I'm gonna let go of that? No, no, you hold oh, on I to hold this. On to that. What okay. I want you to do is hold right here with your left hand, and with your right hand, the arrow's telling you which way to start spinning it. Uh -huh. So start spinning it, and you'll see the valve is going to start to deploy. Start spinning it. More? Faster? Yeah, no, just at that pace. Nice and okay. smooth. Okay, keep coming, keep coming. That's great, keep coming. You'll see it start to open. Dr. Burke, how's it looking? We look fine, you still got a ways to go. Okay. okay. See how I learned that, Dr. Rising, to ask? A little bit deep. So now Dr. Burke is telling me we're a little bit deep, and he'd be telling me that on ultrasound if this were uh, a real case. Keep going. Oh, keep going? Yep. Okay. Look at that. Starting to flower, and as Dr. Burke said, from the bottom up, Dr. Burke, do you like my position there? Might be, that looks pretty good. Maybe a little bit deep, but we're looking good. Okay, I'm stopping somewhere. Okay, now you'll get those rumble bands. Uh -huh. You'll hear that. Now we're gonna just keep uh, opening through that. Okay. Keep going, keep opening through that. Keep going, okay. you're great. Okay. Now look at it starting to starting to open up completely, and yeah. then did you see that little pop? Yeah. You have just done what I would consider to be a near perfect deployment of that valve. So the valve opened, as Dr. Burke showed us, from the bottom up, and then there was a little because this is a very springy material. It's nitinol. It pops open at the very end. Wow. And now come and look at, but Dr. Burke, you want to describe so Brad can see what, what uh, he's actually done there? So what you've done here is that you can see the very bottom of the valve, and there's a little wrap around this with pericardium to prevent any leak. You can see where that black dot is. That's the annulus, and that's where it's going to be anchored fully. You can see that you're perfectly there. You're holding this on as well as you could possibly hope to. You've got the coronary arteries, those two little tubes, that are well above the level of the valve. So this is perfect. So you can still get at those if you need to do intervention like Dr. Rizek does, if somebody's having a heart attack or otherwise needs a stent or something else done. So this was perfectly placed. You know, there's a story that you and I talked about, our, our friend Glenn, he was actually a patient of Dr. Burke's. And this is a gentleman who we first learned that he had valvular heart disease several years ago. And he was in his 90s. I mean, this gentleman was re really uh, uh, quite up there in the years. But because of this technology, he lived another seven or eight years and did beautifully over those seven or eight years. And, and, and there's a great story uh, that I think we, we want to share with our audience. Let's take a look. I'm Glenn. I'm 97. I wake up in the morning with nothing to do. That night, only half of it's done. That's how busy I've been. Spent three years in the Marine Corps. I worked at Caterpillar Tractor Company. Spent time in Brazil. Fished and hunted and played golf, played cards. Had a great, great life. Well, we've been married 73 and one half years, but who's counting? His health was excellent up until gallbladder surgery, and that led to uh, Dr. Burke discovering that he had a heart valve problem. We did not know that. I passed out a few times, and they decided that I needed a new heart valve. And I was too old for open heart surgery, so they went up to the groin, and it lasted over six years years. Well, I've known Glenn now for the better part of 10 years and have been taking care of him. He was one of our first patients to ever have a TAVR placed going back roughly seven years ago. So TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement is where we put in a brand new aortic valve without doing open heart surgery. 
by using a catheter to put a new valve inside there and push the old valve out of the way. In most of the cases, TAVR implants are extremely successful. And initially in Glenn, he was symptomatically very much improved and we were very happy with our initial results. But over time, the valve began to degenerate or change and then he became uh, somewhat symptomatic. I went six years and I played golf and I fished and I traveled and I did everything. And then the second one, that was very obvious because it just kind of happened overnight. Life was not enjoyable. <laughs> I just began to feel, I might say awful, but no appetite and no energy. I stopped walking a mile and a half. It was just not a good life. So when you're evaluating a 97-year-old person, there's always a question of what is the appropriate thing to do. Is it safe to do any procedures? Is there going to be any benefit to the procedure? And in this case, we thought there is a benefit to prolonging his life and improving his quality of life. I mean, he's 97 years old, but he's 97 going on 60. He's got a lot of energy, and he wanted to get better. The best option for him at 97 years old was to place a new valve inside that space. We decided to use the new Boston Scientific Lotus Edge Taver device because some of the attributes of that might be able to seal the leak he had in his old valve. When we implanted the Lotus, initially we were very pleased. Much of the leak that he had surrounding the old valve had gone away, but we still had a little bit of leak left. So we decided to put uh, a vascular plug in alongside the Lotus valve, and that worked beautifully. The results, I think, are even better than they were six, seven years ago. They released me on Sunday, the 16th, and I walked that Sunday, and I walked the Saturday, and I came home, and on Monday, I was able to walk a half a mile. And within two or three days, I was up to a mile, and I'm over a mile most every day. We saw him back in the office last week, and in his own words, we gave him his life back. So he's back to doing his walks, uh, feels significantly better, and our hope is that we're gonna keep him around for another seven years or so, just like we did the last time. We, we think we have a very good life. We don't know how long, but how much longer that will be, but we're hoping for a few more good years. Keep active. You got to keep going and keep moving and uh, do things. Live every day and be active. And uh, I just can't tell you what a fine group of doctors and nurses that I had two days in the hospital. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I had the right team of doctors and uh, can't give them enough credit. Wow, that is the type of excitement we like to see after one of these surgeries no with question. Uh, Dr. Reisig. No question. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, the procedure. If you're just checking in with us, we are about to perform a live heart procedure, aortic replacement. Aortic valve replacement. Thank you very much, doctor. I'm starting to get nervous because this is where we're actually going to be doing it live on the air. Um, and again, Dr. Reisig, uh, a great team you have here. So let's introduce the room. Okay, so first of all, we introduce Dr. Robert Riley, my colleague and uh, extraordinary cardiothoracic surgeon. We're going to partner on this. Uh, our anesthesiologist is Dr. Harrison. Dr. Robert Burke, our extraordinary echocardiographer for many years. You've seen him in these procedures previously. We have uh, a, a, a collection of nurses. We have Melissa, we have Sevda, Jamaica, Sophia, Aaron, and John. A great group of nurses and patient care technicians that are going to all assist. Everybody has a very specific role. Um, and then uh, we're just absolutely delighted to have our clinical support team behind me from Medtronic. Uh, they help to prep the valve and do other clinical support uh, things during the procedure. And none of this is ever possible yeah. without our friends from Siemens Health and Ears. Uh, they've been terrific, terrific partners throughout all of these procedures that we've done. That's amazing. Okay, before we get started too, I want to remind people the way I'm standing right now is, is important because I'm not sitting here, I'm not bored. I know people say, you know, with people's arms, you look like you're bored, but this is where I'm supposed to keep my hands right, right in here because there's a lot going on in here and you want to really pay attention to what is happening here um, with this amazing surgery. Dr. Oh. Riley, 
give us orientation of where we're at on the patient. Okay, so to set up before we uh, went live here, the patient is lying flat on his back on the table here. Uh, head is up to my left, feet are right here. Uh, we are not going through the chest. We're doing all this whole procedure through the groin and we have a catheter in the groin already here for prep and we have a catheter in the wrist over here. So between those two uh, access points, we'll perform the valve implantation. And so you can see a lot of imaging, Brad. Yeah, so what are we looking at right now on, on these screens here? On the screens to the left, we have x-ray, moving x-ray, which we call fluoroscopy. To the right, we have ultrasound or echocardiographic imaging. And no one better to explain what we're seeing on the echo images than Dr. Burke. And in fact, I think what you and I ought to do is start doing our procedure, getting our catheters in place. And Dr. Burke, could you explain the fluoro and the echo, please? So fluoro, that's the x-ray imaging that we have. And so we can see straight through the body. In this case, you can see some wires there that are from the prior sternotomy. That's where he had his prior open heart surgery. And then we've got some wires and tubes inside there. Those are the catheters. And that allows us to see exactly where tissue is going to be. So unfortunately, the heart is invisible on x-ray. You see right through it. And that's why we have to use echocardiography. That's the ultrasound that I'm using right now to be able to look at the valve and see exactly where it is and also where these catheters are. So that's how we help to guide the procedure. And what we're looking at here on I my screen is the aortic valve. On the left side, we're sort of looking down on the valve itself. And on the right side, we're cutting through it at a 90 degree angle. What do you need? Balloon? Wow. Balloon, so we please. can also throw Balloon? color on here that shows blood flow. And in this case, you can see that there's blood flowing backward because we're actually splinting, we're keeping the valve open even when it would otherwise be closed. Now, and that's Burke, because of the wires. Dr. Burke, you've shown us all that calcium on the valve. And before Dr. Riley and I made the decision that before we just proceed with placing the valve, that what we should probably do is try and balloon this uh, this catheter, or uh, use a balloon catheter to dilate up the, um, the, uh, the calcified uh, stiff valve. Absolutely. You balloon can see calcium right there catheter. and there and there. So if you can show this balloon close up, we're going to uh, uh, move this balloon all the way up. Go ahead, Bob. This is on the wire right now. There, that's perfect. And then we'll pass that through the catheter, the sheath that's already in place here. Fluoro. And then we'll look at the fluoro fluoroscopy machine ahead of us and pass it to our mark. Wait one second. Now, Dr. Riley is in position one. He and I alternate who's going to be in position one and who's going to be in position two. Position one really positions the valve. Position two is the one that unrolls the valve into, uh, the, um, into the valve complex, the old valve. And, and here on the fluoroscopy, we have these two markers that show the, the beginning and end of the valve. And we'll just right now pass across where that little curly Q catheter is, the pigtail catheter. That's sitting where the native valve is. So we're halfway across it right now. And you can actually see calcium where that, put it going floral. You can actually see calcium on that. Go ahead and run that. Where that pigtail catheter, that curled up catheter is, you can actually see calcium. And we're gonna try and crack that calcium with this balloon before we go in with the Taver valve. So while we're doing that, we'll ask the anesthesiologist to, to pace the heart at a fast heart rate so that the valve and balloon don't move. And then we'll inflate it with this syringe here that Dr. Rizek has. So Dr. Harrison, if you'll hold respirations and then turn the pacer on at 180. So, so we have good pacer capture, and now the balloon is going up, and and there we crack the valve pretty well. Now the balloon is coming down. Pacer off. The balloon off. is coming down. And fluoro save that. Doctors, why do you have to crack that calcium? There's so much calcium on that that if what we try and do is just um, use a uh, valve to go in there. The valve might not sit right and it might not open up perfectly. Flora, please. The valve might not open up correctly because of that stiff calcium. So we're going to crack the valve first before we go in 
uh, the, the, we're going to crack the God-given valve uh, before we go in with the new TAVR valve. And you see that Bob and I are just kind of working at a, a, a regular pace, very smooth, uh, sort of uneventful uh, deployment so far. So let me also explain to people there, why are you going through, well, you explain why you're going through the groin and not opening the chest like before. When you go through the groin, there's no body cavity that's open. So the recovery is basically just the flesh wound. So there's no, uh, no prolonged need for pain medicine or, or avoidance of activity. Yeah. And, and it's just amazing that from our groin can reach our hearts, and then that's by following a vein. Is that right? what's happening? Uh, the artery. So artery. we go through the femoral artery, uh, like you saw in the animation, and then pass the wires and catheters up the aorta, and then across the native aortic valve. Wow. Okay. Amazing. The next thing we're going to do now is place the valve in. This is the valve, just like that simulator that you used. So, Bob, or can I have a dry lap, please? So now we're going to take out the catheter that was our placeholder and put the valve in through that spot in the groin. And you can see this is like a, uh, what do they say, a four-handed piece of music. Dr. Riley and I are moving, all of our movements are together. Okay, you want to back it out? Yep. All right. Tell me what you think about my wire position. I think we're in good shape. Okay, I have wire. Okay. And Sophia... Uh, who's very experienced, is going to hand me my valve now. She's going to start it on the wire. All of these valves, like the previous uh, devices that you've seen us use on the procedure, everything goes over a wire. So not uh, unusual for these types of procedures. There's a wire all the way up to the heart, and this is going to similarly go over uh, a wire up to the heart. Dr. Riley is going to do most of the positioning. He's going to decide where the optimal position is. Sophia, hold that wire. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to unfurl the valve uh, once we're adequately across. Wait one minute, Bob. Okay, go ahead. I'm ready for you. I'm going to unfurl it as we uh, get into uh, a proper position at the old diseased aortic valve. So you can see at the bottom of your fluoro screen, the catheter coming up, the new valve coming up, okay? All right, wire, hang on, wire. Wow, that is just amazing to see it okay, in person. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Got my wire position. Yeah, we're gonna move the pigtail a little bit, but okay, pull wire back a little bit. Okay, okay, wait, wait, fluoro, fluoro, fluoro. Good, okay. good, perfect, okay, good. Implant ag angle, please. So now you see that TAVR valve. Uh, now let's do this, give me a little toot, give me some contrast. Now that worked perfectly. Yeah, All right. we don't even have to move. All right, so Bob, I'm gonna do this. You be the captain on this one. Okay. You make the call when you want uh, pacing and everything. So we have one person communicating as we do this rather than multiple people. So let's pull the wire a little uh, okay. central. All right. Dr. Harrison, can you turn the pacer on at 120? You like that, that wire position, Bob? Yes. And Bob and I just alternate who's going to be in position one and who's going to be in position two. Uh, that's the best way a heart team works. Everyone can do every job in the room. So now you can see that there's less motion, so we can uh, keep our marker right there at mid pigtail, and then we're going to open up the valve. If you look at Dr. Rizek's hands, he's twisting this, and it's kind of pushing the valve uh, or unsheathing the valve, uh, pulling the catheter off the top. So we're a little high. I'm going to come down to right about there. Now you notice what Dr. Riley just did. I, while I'm unfurling the valve or opening the valve. Pull the wire in a little neutral. Uh, you do the wire, okay, Sophia? So it's really becoming a six-handed uh, okay. uh, procedure. Let's today. hold here. Dr. Harrison, let's pace at 150. And this valve is uh, repositionable, so if we don't like where we land, we can always recapture and uh, put it in a different spot. Pull wire, Sophia. Oops. All right, now push it in a little bit, Sophia. What do you think, Bob? Yep. Okay, I'm going to keep going. And this is just a nice casual pace that we're uh, not a rushed uh, procedure, just a casual pace. And you hear that 
rumbling sound. That means they're near the end of travel for this valve. Can pace her down to 100 centralized wire? Dr. Burke, would you mind stepping in and telling us what you think about the depth of this Off valve on implant? Fluoro, let's do a cine so you can so see So on it a this bit. image right here, you can actually see the valve. We're sort of looking at it, cutting it right through the middle. You can see where the valve has landed here. It's just below the actual annulus, just a tiny bit. And that's really where we typically like to see it. Looks like that's opening up very well right now. Now, don't forget, this is a memory metal. It's night and all. It's going to expand over time, and it continues to do that because it wants to get back to its original shape. That's a very, very, very important point. When we put this in, night and all, or uh, nickel titanium, uh, is when it's cold, they prep it in cold water, it's very small. Dr. Riley, what happens when it comes in contact with uh, the warmth of uh, uh, the blood, uh, 98 uh, six degrees uh, Fahrenheit? So it will return to its natural state, so it'll expand. Right, okay. Let's uh, push wire a little bit, see where we're at. Come down to 80 on the pacemaker. Dr. Burke, our depth, are you happy with that? Looks like we might be a little bit deep there below the uh, left. So, right Dr. Riley, do you think it'll come up on a release, or what would you like to do? I think that our let's uh, let's do a different modality. Let's go ahead and inject contrast here and see our depth based upon the fluoroscopy as well. You ready? Go ahead. I think we're talking the difference of millimeters here. I, I think that pretty uh, happy with the way this looks. What do you think? What would you do if, uh, what, would you, what do you think we should do? Think we have the option, I asked Dr. Riley that, we have the option of recapturing this or deploying it just like it is. So what should we do? I think that we should uh, pace and deploy it where it is. Okay. I think that the uh, right side of the screen will rise up a little bit as we release it and it will center itself. And, and keep in mind, Brad, this entire time, this is a casual conversation between us with our anesthesiologist with Dr. Burke, our echocardiographer. We're not rushing, we're moving at a methodical, uh, but, but a progressive pace. Yeah, and, and so for those at home, you said that you put a dye in there. What's the dye to do to see where actually things are pumping and going with it? It, it, it shows, it helps to show the valve, it helps to show the depth of our implant. We don't want to be too deep, we don't want to be too high. We want to see the coronary arteries. You can see the coronary arteries filling. You can see the entire landscape where we're working. When you put the contrast in and when Dr. Burke advances his echo probe, you can see the echo probe just to the left of the valve on that screen. Dr. Riley, you know, anything I'm, else? I'm uh, just still debating whether we should make it uh, two, two or three millimeters higher. Okay, then, and we're, then I have to say we do it. Okay, okay. all right. Okay. So I am going to recapture this valve. Centralize the wire so it doesn't come aortic. Okay. Pace at 120, please. So now you can see very easily, I'm reversing directions with my dial and we're recapturing the valve. And we can do this multiple times until we perfect the position of the valve. And Dr. Riley has probably the most important job right now. He's trying to make sure that valve stays centralized and doesn't dive into the pumping chamber or into the aorta. And Dr. Riley, that's why this surgery is so important because before if you had the chest open, you had to move very quickly and, and have to get things in place and, and not really knowing. Here you're able to make the move if you need to. What do you think about that? Right about there. there. Okay. Yes. And what do you think about our wire there? Let's Dr. check our pigtail catheter. Okay. Let's give a toot there. I think that may have. Actually, it's perfect. Oh, that looks perfect. Okay. Uh, pace at about a buck fifty, please. And so, Sophia, we're going to uh, pull the wire a little bit here. Stop. I love your depth right now, Dr. Riley. I love the depth. So now I'm going to move a little bit faster in deploying this. Now, Dr. Burke, you're up again. Pacer down to um, 90. 
So I think we moved the valve up of probably three or four millimeters. It looks like a substantial movement. So the impressive part is we moved the valve three millimeters and we're 180 centimeters away from it. I mean, think about that. This is 180 <laughs> centimeters and we're talking about millimeter movements, but that's the difference between a good deployment and, and, an, and a less than perfect deployment. And what we shoot for, the, Dr. Burke, Dr. Riley and I, we aim for technical perfection because what we leave this patient with is going to make the difference between whether this patient has long-term durability of the valve, has symptoms after the procedure or not. It's extremely important to try and achieve technical perfection with every one of these valve implants. Dr. Burke? 80. This is looking great. Might have a little trivial leak there, but Centralized that wire. will typically go away over time as the valve continues to expand. Troy, I love this. I think this is a keeper. What do you think, I think Dr. I'm going to lay over a little bit while okay. you release it, All right. and we'll release it with pacing again. What okay. Why don't you make the call? So let's pace at 180. Are you on, Bob? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Centralized wire a little bit, and we're going to release very slow, and you'll see at the top of the uh, marker here, the valve will open up there. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Okay, I'm and still on one. I think it just gave. Still have to call it. So do your thing, Dr. Yeah. Riley. Go ahead and drop the pacer a little bit. Oh, there it is. Now we just released. All right, centralize the wire. Okay. Okay. I'm going to retrieve. And there it is. So now the valve is out. Okay, so Dr. Riley, would you do pacer me a favor? Pacer down, please. Would it's you give me a new 035 wire, an 035J. You can pull the, uh, let, me, let me capture this first. All right, floral, please. Live. Live. Show that, please. Come down. Aaron, come down, please. Thank you. That's perfect. Perfect. Okay, may I have an 035J wire? You can take that. Dr. Burke, position? Uh, this looks great. Okay, could you, I'm going to fluoro now. Could you go up to the new valve? Now you can see Dr. Burke's probe uh, is there. Bob, come back just for a split yep. second. Let me have a J wire, please. Okay, now I'm going to do a cine. I'm going to the short J. Capture this, and there's the new valve. Wow. That's it. That's that's right there. Doctor, Doctor Burke, on a scale of one to ten, what did we do? Oh, uh, this is great. This is a ten. All right. So, huh? so Doctor, since you put in the new one, where does the old valve go? Uh, great, great, great question. I was always told when the host of the show asks <laughs> a question, never say that was a great question because that's his job, but. That was a great question. Um, we just sort of, Flora, please. We just sort of wallpaper over the old valve. And that's the best way to think of it, is wallpapering. We push the old valve aside. Now, different from surgery. When we perform surgery, Dr. Riley cuts out the old valve, correct, and sews in a new valve. Correct as opposed to wallpapering over it. We just push the old valve aside, put a new valve in over it, and that's it. Well, how long will this one last? You know, that's a great question. Bob, uh, we, you've been doing surgical valves for decades. We know the durability of surgical valves very well, don't we? Yes. This valve is built off of the same platform, so we're optimistic that it will last as long as a surgery valve, but there may be some things that happen when you crimp it and make it small before, it, so you can pass it in through the leg. But we have very good durability for the, for the 10 years that we've been using the valve. And I think that's the great point. We've been doing surgical valves for 50 years. This is 10 years old, this technology. Um, and so we're still trying to learn and understand how long these valves are going to last. So we're still sort of in the, uh, in the uh, infancy stage compared to surgical valves, but the technology has moved so rapidly that we have great optimism about this. So, all right, if, if someone's wondering now, going, okay, so maybe I need to get a new valve, something like this, do you go back in and take the old one out, or do you replace it, like you said, to expand in that area? Well, there, there are several choices. One, we could talk to Dr. Riley about going in and surgically removing this, this uh, valve, or we can do what's called a valve and valve. We can go inside this, this valve with a new valve and, uh, and make, uh, open it up all over again if this valve should degenerate. We do that 
with surgical valves that degenerate, and we do that with catheter-based or TAVR valves that degenerate. You always get another chance uh, if the valve should uh, fail or degenerate over time. Okay, so this, I mean, this went pretty quick for people who are watching at home going, wow, this is, this is very fast. But what about recovery time for the patient? The, Dr. Burke, you want to talk about recovery? So recovery time, as uh, Dr. Riley alluded to earlier, really is much, much faster because really it's just dealing with the access site in the groin where we access the artery. So people are often home within the next 24 hours. Wow. So amazing as you're going through this and the teams of control. So the next step in all of this now is we're going to close the hole, the very small hole in the groin. So let's just load the manta up then. Uh, you want to just load the manta? Okay. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is close the hole in the groin uh, so that in a couple hours we can sit the patient up. We have several different devices, some suture mediated devices, some collagen plugs to close the hole, but in either event, we are going to uh, do that right now. I'm going to tell you Protamine, what. please. And, and some of the blood thinners that we've given, now we're giving medications to reverse those. Um, you want to do this and sure. I'll step over? Absolutely. Could you help uh, Dr. Riley do this, please? And then Brad and I will step over here. And now the way here. So as we've seen this happen, people are probably wondering, okay, you said that he had open heart surgery. So you can actually do this surgery even with someone who's had open heart surgery. You know, the, when, when Dr. Riley and I talk about this procedure, he reminds me that we came up with this procedure as a profession, especially for those who have already had open heart surgery, so that they don't have to have a second open heart surgery. Remember something, open heart surgery is done all the time. It's a great technology. Um, but if we don't have, to, if the first valve done surgically fails, so that we don't have to open the chest again, we can put one of these transcatheter non-surgical valves inside the old surgical valve so, uh, so that we don't have to cut the chest open again. If someone's sitting at home right now watching this and maybe not feeling well and maybe you think it's their heart, what are some of the things they need to look for when they do want to call their physician? Yeah, you know, um, the, the, the symptoms that we talked about, um, we talk about shortness of breath and fatigue, probably far and away the most common symptoms. So if you are feeling shortness of breath and fatigue, especially if you're over 70 years of age, because most of the patients that we do are over 70, but if you're starting to um, lose some of your exercise uh, tolerance, some of your, and you're starting to get short of breath, uh, some of the stamina is not there, then I think you should get to your doctor and, and get evaluated, get seen. If your doctor hears a heart murmur or has some clue, if the antennas go up to suggest that there is a valve problem, then that uh, primary care physician, internist, family practice doctor should get you to a cardiologist for a cardiovascular evaluation and someone like Dr. Burke to uh, do an echocardiogram. Oh. Yep, that. So as he steps over that way, you can see that they are working here. And if you're just tuning in, this is uh, a live heart procedure that we just did here at Honor Health Shea with Dr. Rizek and his team, uh, which is amazing. Uh, it was a aortic valve replacement. Um, and we'll have more of it on aztv.com slash procedure. But uh, as they're going through things, they're checking things out. Um, and again, successful with this team here, which is so amazing. So um, we do want to ask you, doctor, um, again, when will this patient be able to uh, go home? Well, uh, Dr. Uh, Burke did much of the workup of this patient. Dr. Burke, in your experience, how soon will these patients go home after this procedure? So on average, our experience here is that they go home within the next 24 to 36 hours. So uh, starting early in the morning, typically we'd expect to take another look at them in the morning following, recheck an ultrasound, make sure that the heart looks good, and then hopefully around lunchtime, uh, be on their way out the door. I, I do want to draw your attention to one thing, and I, this, is, uh, this is really a, 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 a great procedure in that Dr. Riley has the opening in the groin closed already. That's it. Wow, amazing. And, and that is 20 our, minutes uh, skin to skin. And that's our live heart procedure. Dr. Isaac, uh, again, I appreciate you inviting me along with our AZTV, um, of course, viewers into the operating room to do this. And it's amazing. And we do want you to see more by going to aztv.com slash procedure.